Hello everyone, my name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. Today I have a special guest in my show. Why is he special? Well, he's a geoscientist with, with 20 years in mineral exploration and he knows the path of how to find big deposits in the Athabasca Basin since he was actively involved in a few major discoveries. He will tell us which ones uh, and how to find them. I am pleased to have Andy Carmichael, Vice President of Exploration for Cosa Resources. Andy, welcome. It is great to have you. Well, it's great to be here. And thanks for that very generous introduction. <laughs> yeah, all truth. I, I didn't make it up. Uh, Andy, let's start with... Uh, can you please introduce Cosa and the team, uh, of course, yourself and your experience in Uranium? Absolutely. Uh, COSA is a team of uh, uranium explorers. We're a pretty new company, um, but we've been around the Athabasca Basin for a long time. Uh, we're mostly geologists. Our chair is a guy named Steve Blower. It was just a tremendous record of exploration success in the Athabasca Basin, and most notably leading the team that discovered uh, Denison's Griffin deposit and ISO Energy's Hurricane deposit. Our CEO is Keith Bonnerchuk, another geologist who uh, I worked with at Denison, um, who decided he'd rather run companies than drilling programs and is turning out to be really good at it. Um, and it's great to have a CEO with such a strong technical background. And uh, I'm Andy Carmichael, I'm the VP of Exploration, and I've spent my whole career in mineral exploration, uh, the overwhelming majority, which has been in the Athabasca Basin. Um, along with our corp dev manager, Justin Rodko, uh, we're part of the team that discovered uh, the hurricane deposit and took it to the initial resource and in, incidentally the highest grade uranium deposit in the world. Excellent. So you were a key member in discovery of uh, ISO Energy hurricane deposit. Uh, can you talk a bit more about the process and uh, what did you did differently? Yeah, it was it was a really exciting and fun time and it was a, a short path from from acquiring the project to making that discovery, you know. Um, we got the opportunity to get the Larockies project that Hurricanes within, and um, we were really excited about it. The project sat on a known mineralized trend, um, although admittedly in a somewhat unloved part of the basin, it was generally thought that uh, in the Majatic, that part of the basin, there wouldn't be any major deposits. Mm -hmm. um, and so over its 30-year history, 40-year history, the project had really just gotten a little bit of work done on it here and there, but no uh, focused, directed exploration. Um, but it had weak mineralization, both on trend to the southwest and within the project, and it had a ton of exploration space left, so we were really excited to get it. And once we got the project, we really dug into that historical data uh, at a desktop level. We modeled the geology, made geological map, flagged everything we thought was interesting, and then we went to the field and looked at all this historical drill floor just to make sure that uh, what was reported matched what we thought, and we actually thought it was better. Than, than how it sounded in the historical logs. Uh, and one target in particular stuck out. There was an historical hole called Kirk Well that uh, it didn't intersect any weak mineralization, but it was right in the middle of a one kilometer stretch where a number of holes had intersected mineralization. And when we looked at that hole, it just looked like an overshot. It looked like it had been very close, a uh, very close near miss. Uh, and so we backed up and uh, drilled a parallel hole 40 meters away and the end, the end result is three weeks after we looked at that drill core, two months after we got the project, we found the hurricane zone with our first drill hole on the project. That's a great story, a great one. Uh, Andy, can you give me an overview of COSA's projects and what uh, your exploration strategy is this time around? Yeah, I we have 10 projects right now, um, totaling a little over 160,000. Uh, hectares in the Athabasca Basin region. We've been acquiring uh, a lot of projects through staking. You know, these are our projects. We own them 100%. Mm -hmm. um, collectively, I'd say they all have individual characteristics that make them interesting. They all have their own unique shine. Um, but they have one great commonality, and that's they're all really underexplored. These are not Swiss cheese projects that you might see elsewhere in a lot of the eastern Athabasca. These are these all have a ton of room left to make a discovery. Um, I'd say perhaps our most exciting project is the URSA project. It's uh, it's our largest project. Um, 
it covers about 65 kilometer strike length of a crustal scale structure called the cable base shear zone. Um, and then within the project, we recently defined over 100 kilometers of conductive strike length within the project. So it's just an incredible amount of uh, prospective ground to explore. Um, and despite that, it's seen really very limited exploration. There's 15 historical drill holes on the project. And even though there's very few drill holes for that size of a project, three of them have intersected weak mineralization. And so we're really encouraged by the results to date. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what is the typical exploration model for the Athabasca uranium? Yeah, the, the typical exploration model, especially in the eastern Athabasca, is, is called the conductor model. So um, these deposits tend to be associated with uh, these graphitic basement rocks, and they are conductive, they're identified as conductors with electromagnetic surveys, whereas the, the granites and the other meta sediments are not. And so um, generally the strategy has been to complete EM surveys and look for good quality basement hosted EM conductors. Um, that are in magnetic lows. So that tells you there's probably meta sediments and that they're conductive and that you they might have a good chance of having graphitic politic rocks in the basement. Um, and then systematically testing those conductors. And, you know, that's been a really successful strategy. And it's one we intend to apply to our projects, but on a slightly different way, um, especially at URSA, um, where we're really looking to refine target areas instead of systematically exploring wide areas. We want to develop relatively smaller target areas to focus our efforts in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I get it. But uh, Andy, can you expand a little bit more on the history of uh, URSA and Orion, please? Yeah. Um, URSA hasn't seen a lot of work. You know, the last time it really saw, really the only time it saw a significant amount of exploration work was from around the mid 90s to the early 2000s. Um, you know, technolog technology was a major limited factor at that time. The contemporary people, they kind of had to work through it in a systematic way, in a way that we wouldn't do today. Um, mm -hmm. They completed these ground EM surveys uh, on, a, on a piecemeal basis, just progressing northward through the project. And then so they, one winter they would do ground EM, and then the following winter they would follow it up with drilling, and then the next winter more ground EM. And um, the end result was it took them a lot of time to only test a very small portion of the project. Um, and, and they effectively got tired of doing it and the uranium market softened and the project kind of went away. Um, it saw a little bit of activity in the last cycle in the 2000s, but um, you know, Fukushima happened and it was again shelved. But uh, these days we have, we have new tools at our disposal that are gonna allow us to really um, prioritize areas within the project and avoid that systematic drilling because with 100 kilometers of conductive strike, it's just not feasible to, to test it at the closet spacing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Cable Bay uh, shear zone. Uh, what makes URSA and Cable Bay shear zone, zone so interesting? Uh, what is the significance of uranium corridors? Yeah, it's, it's one and the same reason makes them both interesting. Uh, all the Athabasca uranium deposits are structurally controlled. Without a good quality basement rooted structure, you just will not form a deposit in the Athabasca basin. And so that's one of the fundamental things you're looking for at all times. Uh, the major deposits tend to be located on or immediately adjacent to major structural corridors. Cable base shear zone is a crustal scale, regional scale, major structural zone that transects the Athabasca basin. And if you look at comparable corridors uh, in the Athabasca Basin, virtually all of them have a major deposit located along them. Um, but the cable base shear zone is a bit unique in that it's perhaps the least explored of all the major conductors, or all the least explored of all the major structural corridors. And so it's a relatively unique opportunity, especially for a company of COSA's size to control such a huge swath of such a very prospective piece of the Athabasca Basin. Yeah, good answer. Uh, what is the plan for exploration at such a large project, uh, effectively and efficiently? Yeah, so as I noted, you know, what we want to do is avoid systematic drilling. You know, different groups talk about systematic exploration, and that's something we want to avoid at the URSA project. I'd say 
as a group, historically, we've been really drill forward. You know, Hurricane had zero geophysics involved in its discovery um, during our time there. It was completely geologically driven observations and inferences that led to that discovery. But um, Ursa is a bit too big for that sort of approach. It's just massive. And so area reduction is going to be the key for this project. And so what we've done is we completed a project scale airborne geophysical survey. And, you know, it marks the first time this kind of survey has been completed over that part of the basin, the cable base shear zone uh, covered by URSA. And it's the first time that uh, the entire project's been evaluated with a single survey, allowing the real apples to apples comparisons of different areas. Um, and what we're trying to do is identify first all the conductive strike that's within the project, right? Because the EM conductors are the most prospective portions. That's a great first step in area reduction. Um, and that gets us down to, you know, that 100 kilometers of strike um, rather than, than uh, 60,000 hectares. Um, but the next stage is to find zones of anomalism along those conductive trends. So we're looking for areas of structural complexity in the basement, bends, stepovers, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Inter interpreted cross structures. And then secondly, we're looking for anomalism in the sandstone. These deposits require huge volumes of fluid to form, enormous hydrothermal cells operating for a long time. And the sandstone is generally non-conductive, very resistive material. But having those systems operating so long, it changes the bulk properties of the sandstone and it tends to add clay to the system and increase the conductance of the sandstone. So we're looking for conductivity anomalies in the sandstone above basement conductors. Um, that might suggest to us that there was a very large and long-lived hydrothermal system there. And that, that's ultimately the drill target. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you did a large airborne survey this time, right? Uh, and what were the, expand a little bit on what were the main objectives of such a large airborne survey? So um, the objective of that survey was to evaluate the entire project really quickly and really efficiently. You know, it's very low cost to cover something that, that large uh, with a property-wide airborne survey. Um, the goal was to identify a small percentage of the project that we wanted to follow up. Uh, as we did not want to do systematic, you know, regular space drilling on this enormous project. We want to get straight into the juice uh, as quickly as possible. Um, we think we've been successful with that. We think we've identified about 25 kilometer strike length that we think is a, a really good target. It's about 10 separate target areas that match the criteria. We're looking for kilometer scale zones of anomalism, something that's going to match uh, something of significant size. We're looking for something that's a tier one uranium deposit, a massive system. And uh, we found just in an initial interpretation, about 10 areas that, that we think are geophysically consistent uh, signatures with that kind of a target. Yeah, so that will be the significance of the results of the survey for Ursa and Orion, right? Absolutely. Yep. It's identifying a relatively smaller uh, total area to follow up and avoid that uh, systematic systematically marching through the project with the drill. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andy, what uh, will be the next steps for both projects? Yeah, the next the next steps are target refinement. You know, um, the analogy I'd make is the is that the airborne survey has been it's really effective for giving us a great overall high level picture, but trying to drill off of it would be a bit like trying to find a specific house um, on a map of a country. Right, the the map's going to show you where you need to go within the country but it's not going to be very good for finding the house. So the next step is, is very much improving the resolution of those results. And the way to do that is with the industry best ground electromagnetic surveys. Um, that's going to allow us to refine conductor locations down to a drill targetable scale. Um, and we're planning to do that this fall and winter. That was my next question. When do you expect uh, to, uh, to to commence this drilling? So next winter, you said. Yeah, we're aiming to drill this winter. We were procuring the geophysical capacity now. 
Um, we're expecting that to go on in late 2023, early 2024, the data acquisition. And then while that's going on, we plan to be uh, establishing access to the project for the drill and hopefully drilling uh, towards the later part of the winter. Excellent. Uh, Andy, I wish you luck with that. Uh, that was Andy Carmichael, Vice President of Exploration for COSA Resources. Uh, Andy, thank you very much and good luck. Yeah, thanks very much. It was great to be on.